Hi everyone, welcome back to my channel. This is Dr. Shilpi here. This video is a continuation of the previous video in which I had covered the other aspects of trigeminal neuralgia. So let's get started. Coming to the clinical we have in the clinical features the older adults are more commonly affected and it occurs older than 40 years of age the average age of onset is 50 years Ma females are more commonly affected uh, affected the right side of the face is more commonly affected it can occur in either of the three trigeminal uh, dermatomes but you know it occurs most commonly in maxillary and mandibular branches and it is strictly unilateral occurs on one side of the face but bilateral cases occur and in less than 5% of the cases it can be bilateral they are very rare and they're in the patients with classical trigeminal neuralgia rarely complain of sensory loss so usually in uh, trigeminal neuralgia no whenever we do a clinical examination sensory loss is not seen so whenever we see a sensory loss there's usually you know a typical type of trigeminal neuralgia you know where we can see sensory loss so usually it is not present and a background pain can be present in few patients the presence of objective facial sensory loss facial weakness and ataxia if they are present it should raise a possibility of any kind of cns tumor and not trigeminal neuralgia in such cases then come talking about the type of pain it's paroxysmal it's shooting sharp piercing stabbing you know searing lancinating type or electrical electrical type of pain and it you know lasts usually from fraction of a second to up to two minutes and it disappears as promptly as it arises and in the early stage of the disease the pain is relatively mild but as attacks progress over a period of months and years it becomes more more severe and it starts occurring at frequent intervals then as the attack occurs the patient may clutch his or her face in the terror of the dreaded pain and the patient is free of the symptoms between the attacks but unfortunately the frequency of occurrence of painful seizures cannot be predicted sometimes you know patient can have you know these refractory periods for years altogether the patient will not have pain and sometimes pain can occur even multiple times in a day then it is usually accompanied by spasm of the ipsilateral facial muscles hands it's known as tic dolorex and then coming to the trigger area so trigger areas are basically areas on the face which are precipitated by light innocuous touch when we touch these areas the pain can get precipitated and it's usually occurs uh, you know in it occurs in the distribution of the affected trigeminal nerve but they can also be extra trigeminal that means that can, it can occur even in the areas which are not pertaining to the trigeminal distribution of the trigeminal nerve and they may be multiple and they can also change location it's not that today on touching the aloe of the knees if the patient is having pain then the other day the patient can present with pain you know when the orbit of the uh, you know patient or you know it's touched so it can change the location so it usually occurs in ella of the nose the nasolabial area the cheeks the upper and lower lip the chin the alveolar gingiva and around the eye so usually any given patient usually has only single trigger areas but multiple trigger areas can also be present then there are two attack related phenomena that are particular to trigeminal neuralgia one is latency one is refractory period so latency basically it's the short so when whenever we touch the trigger area or tri uh, at that time once we touch it and then you know the pain starts so the duration from the time of touching and the onset of the pain is known as latency period then there's something known as refractory period so refractory period suppose today i am having an attack at this point of time and after that time you know i'm having pain and then my pain stops then you know after some time even if i touch my trigger point i do not get pain so that time period when i touch the trigger area and even then i do not get any pain you know whenever you know i am stimulating an area and still i don't get pain that is known as the refractory period these are the pain free periods between two episodes of pain then coming to pre trigeminal neuralgia 
Neuralgia, pre-trigeminal neuralgia is an early form of trigeminal neuralgia and uh, it occurs before trigeminal neuralgia, hence, hence its name. It's characterized by dull continuous pain for days to years altogether before it turns into, into a classical type of trigeminal neuralgia. So it's very difficult to basically diagnose this because it's a continuous kind of pain it's not typical of trigeminal neuralgia so usually this diagnosis is given when all the other possibilities or all the other causes have been ruled out or you know when class suppose after one year or two years it develops into classical trigeminal neuralgia so that time we tell you know th that before the patient was presenting with pre-trigeminal neuralgia then coming to the investigation so in investigations we can a neurological examination can be done you know clinically and uh, mostly these patients do not detect uh, these neurological examination can you know you can detect any neurological deficit in these patients and area of involvement can be seen uh, you know in these patients trigger areas can be asked for when you take the history and whenever you examine usually the neurological examination a sensory deficit whenever it's seen or you know absent trigeminal reflexes if they are present or bilateral uh, bilateral involvement is present then it suggests a typical kind of trigeminal neuralgia because in typical in the classical trigeminal neuralgia usually the patient is not going to present with any kind of sensory deficit or you know absent trigeminal reflexes and even the pain is going to be unilateral in those cases then further mri scanning of the brain can be done to detect the secondary causes like you know multiple sclerosis or any kind of tumor in those cases we can do MRI scanning then you know for classical trigeminal neuralgia it pro it's the best method for evaluation for any distortion displacement indentation so routine neuroimaging can be done and you know high resolution MRI that is three Tesla that can be used to identify neurovascular compression and lower resolution 1.5 Tesla can be used for identification of any space occupying lesions then preoperative magnetic resolution tomographic angiography is also being suggested and then diffusion tensor imaging can be uh, also done that can also be used uh, to diagnose it and it can show how the nerve structure is altered as a result of neurovascular compression and uh, then fractional anisotropy can also be used it can also suggest it's a this fractional anisotropy basically can infer the alterations that occur in the axonal diameter of the nerve or fiber density it can actually tell you a lot about the myelin structure of the nerve so basically it shows dysmyelination or demyelination in patients with trigeminal neuralgia then additional advanced neuroimaging studies can be done where you can assess the thick thickness of the gray matter or you know specific CNS subregions can be seen then evoked potentials uh, quantitative sensory testing and electrophysiologic studies can also help us to detect symptomatic trigeminal neuralgia then coming to the histopathologic features so as such there are no specific histopathologic features but in the trigger points they can show fibrosis or infiltration of small number of chronic inflammatory cells then focal areas of myelin degeneration have also been reported with the within the gasserian ganglion ganglion and also along the course of the cranial nerve itself so that brings us to the end of the video. So if you have any doubts or queries, you can leave a message in the comment section below. And if you have liked the video, do hit the like button and don't forget to share and subscribe. And thank you so much for watching. Thank you.